Hi, this is Dr. Doug Willen. In today's video, we're going to go over nine reasons why you may be tired. Plus, I have a bonus reason at the end, so hang in for that. Um, I put together some info for you, and um, I'm a chiropractor from New York City, but I also am a clinical nutritionist. I'm author of a book called Quantum Paleo, and I enjoy making videos that show people practical ways to rebuild their health. Um, so let's talk about fatigue. First of all, you have to look at the amount of sleep and at different ages, we need, we have different requirements for sleep. For example, newborns, uh, it would be common and healthy for a newborn to sleep 14 to 17 hours a day. Now, if at the age of 40, you're sleeping 14 to 17 hours a day, that would be a concern. Uh, infants, 12 to 15 hours, toddlers, 11 to 14. And I'm not gonna read them all to you because you can see for yourself, but adults, seven to nine hours. Um, seniors, maybe seven to eight hours. And you see teenagers, uh, eight to 10 hours. So I, I guess I just read them all to you. Um, even though I promised you I wouldn't. Uh, your sleep needs can also be affected by health and lifestyle factors. So when you're pregnancy, you may require more sleep. Uh, when you're sick, of course. Um, aging depends. Some people sleep less as they get older. Some people sleep more. Uh, sleep deprivation. So if you're, you know, maybe working the night shift at a factory or you are have a lot of stress in your life or you have a, a toddler or a newborn at home with you as a young parent, you might be waking up to take care of the baby throughout the night and you start to develop sleep deprivation or sleep debt, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, also the quality of sleep. So you might not have gotten a deep, restful, recharging sleep. And remember that this, uh, this video today, uh, I will be making more videos that'll dive deeper into every subject or every topic, subtopic on this video. Uh, but for now, I just want to do a general overview so that you could start to go, oh, wow, maybe I, I need to look a little deeper at that thing. You, you didn't even look at it yet. But I'll be making uh, more videos on some of the t individual topics as well as how to improve your sleep. I already have a video up called um, Sleep Myths Revealed. And I think uh, that would be interesting to take a look at and, and see if you have any of these notions about sleep that may or may not be true. Uh, so, s what are some of the problems with with s fatigue or sleep? So, if you're not being rested, besides it impacting your life, your immune system, you could have trouble with alertness. Uh, you're going to have difficulty with memory. So, some people go, "Oh, my memory's not as good." That may be true as we age. Okay, granted, but it also could be because you're sabotaging your your ability to have mental acuity because you're not sleeping. Um, sleep or being tired all the time could have a stress with your relationships. Um, overall, you're gonna have a lower quality of life when you're not rested and increased chance of any type of accident. So what's causing me to be so tired? And uh, that's what we're gonna take a look at. So here's, uh, first nine reasons and then I put a little bonus one in um, because it's a topic that I enjoy lecturing on. Um, but let's just talk about it really in no specific order. It's just the order that came up as I was putting this together. Iron deficiency. So iron deficiency is also commonly called anemia. It's a condition that can make you feel extremely run down, exhausted. Uh, and that's because iron is what produces the red blood cells. And without enough red blood cells, you can't supply your organs with the amount of oxygen they need to function properly. And that's how we get energized from the cellular level on up. Other symptoms of this condition, when you have anemia, could be shortness of breath, heart palpitations, that's that little fluttery feeling, um, pallor where you're washed out and pale. Um, iron deficiency is more common, uh, or we think of it more with menstruating women, and about one in 20 men uh, might get it comparatively. Uh, sleep apnea, it's something I know a little bit about on a personal level, because my dad has sleep apnea. Uh, he sleeps one of those PAP machines. 
Um, it's a condition where your throat may narrow or even close for up to 10 seconds or sometimes even more when you sleep, which basically you stop breathing. And this can make it more difficult for you to breathe, causing you to wake up. And it could be fatal. So it's something to look at. Um, in this case, my stepmom uh, was really, I think, the one who diagnosed it or was suspicious of it. So this, I don't remember how many years ago, maybe uh, could be eight to 10 years ago now that my dad did get that diagnosis. But my stepmom thought, first of all, people snore a lot and snore really loud and, and heavy and more as the years go by. So that's a clue. Uh, but then my uh, stepmom noticed he was almost not sleeping and she was startled thinking maybe, you know, he was dead. So she, um, you know, told him he really needed to see his doctor about it. They put him in one of those sleep observation clinics where you sleep overnight and they uh, monitor you. I don't even know how you can sleep with all the wires attached and you're kind of in a fishbowl being watched while you sleep. But he got through that and he got the diagnosis and now he's at least safer and he's sleeping deeper and at least we're not going to have him die in the night from sleep apnea. So um, depression is, is another big one. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why we're tired a lot, where people are depressed. Tiredness is a common symptom of depression. Depression can literally make you feel drained, all of, feel like all your energy is drained out. Um, when someone's depressed, they also don't feel like working out. So maybe I'm with a patient and I can say, why don't you work out more? And that may or may not be appropriate if someone is suffering from depression because when you're depressed, no, 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 hear me out here because yes, it's a great idea. They should work out, but it's hard to, to break that, that stuck feeling, that paralysis of not being able to move forward in your life. And so you have to be sensitive to it. And uh, it's not just simply giving someone a jolly good, uh, you know, just get going, get over it. Because depression's a lot more intense than, than that, especially if you haven't had it. So yes, I want them to exercise more, but sometimes it's uh, better to, to let them get supported in whatever way they're gonna start to make their initial breakthrough. Then they can gradually start to exercise. They should look at their diet more um, and little by little put the pieces back together. But it's going to be a multifaceted approach with depression. It's not just simply trying to create more energy um, or trying to be in a better mood. Other symptoms of uh, when you're depressed other than just tiredness is that feeling of hopelessness. Um, it can increase anxiety, low sex drive which is your sexual libido, you're just not in the mood. And um, you can literally have more aches and pains physically uh, with mild to severe depression. Um, again, a lot of these topics I'll do individual videos on and spend more time, but I just wanted this one to kind of be a tour through this. Uh, in many ways, uh, just to give you a chance to look at some of these topics and also the curiosity to dive deeper. Now, pregnancy, um, you know, pregnancy is not a, a disease, so don't think of it that way. I put it up because sometimes people don't know they're pregnant, so they're running around exhausted. They're in that first few weeks where they, uh, they did get pregnant and they may or may not be aware if they missed their period or not because not everybody has a regular cycle and you just feel exhausted all the time. It might be worth uh, seeing if that is appropriate to you. Um, you know, is it possible? Were you with someone that you could have got pregnant? And it would be worth taking a look at either to see your uh, general practitioner, medical doctor, or get a home test and just see where you stand. Because uh, the early symptoms of pregnancy, besides the missed period, you can get tender breast tissue, feel nauseous all the time, increased in urination. Um, so, um, I just threw that one up there. Number five is diabetes. Big one. I mean, I could do 30 videos on this one or a hundred videos on this one, but let's just touch on it for a second. Uh, being overly tired is one of the main symptoms of diabetes. So it's not, you know, we, we think of the blood sugar. We think of so many different things. When I was in, um, taking my national boards for my chiropractic degree 20 some odd years ago. I remember um, 
whenever there was a question, like a case study question with someone with multiple possible symptoms and ailments, um, you would look on the uh, multiple choice answers for diabetes because diabetes hits every system of the body. It's um, probably, I think it's the number one cause of blindness in the United States. It's the number one cause for amputation in the United States. It affects every organ, every cell, every system of the body. But one of the things that you'll feel if you have diabetes, especially if it's not being handled through proper medication and balance and diet and exercise is fatigue. You may also feel excessively thirsty, depending on what type of diabetes you have, frequent urination, um, you could lose weight. Uh, there, there, it's, it's a whole topic, but uh, let's move on. I just didn't want to um, not hit on that. Oh, a little bit more with diabetes. Um, one of the blood tests that I, I do recommend to my patients that I think you should ask for, now of course, if you are already have diabetes, your doctor's already doing this, but let's say, you're in your 40s and you just don't know why you feel sick and tired all the time and no one has really come up with a diagnosis, when you get your routine yearly exam, ask for specifically the A1C test. It's not bad to throw that in when they do the normal blood work. Very often they do it anyway, so you know, forgive me if I'm bringing up something that's obvious, but I know many people here in uh, New York City that don't get that done unless they ask for it. Uh, so it's nice to check. Now, what is that test? It has two names or two common names. One is A1C, like I put up there, and uh, hemoglobin A1C. So what it basically does is um, the A1C test evaluates the average amount of glucose in the blood over the last two to three months by measuring a percentage of the glycated hemoglobin in the blood. So let me tell you why I like this test. If you just do a home little uh, blood prick test uh, and you're, you're not full blown, you know, you're not, you, you, you might be pre-diabetic, you might not be, we don't know yet. Like I said, you're just starting to be curious uh, no crisis is hit where it's obvious. When there's a crisis, it's really easy to get a diagnosis. But when you're in that fuzzy borderline for a couple of years, it's hard to dial in on why. So the uh, just taking a test, like I could grab, my mother is diabetic, I could grab her test and just test it and nothing comes up, you know, it's average. So um, that doesn't tell me much. But if I do a hemoglobin A1C test because it's taste tech, taking basically an average of the last two to three months, um, then you can really get a clear read because you're not just testing one single morning, you're getting more of a bigger overhead shot of where you're at with blood sugar level, balance, um, insulin, things like that. Okay, so that's a good test. Here's a little bit left. Um, so normal would be below 5.7. And it, it, when it comes up on your score, you just get a score. They don't usually have the percentage number next to it. So it'll just say 5.7, you'll get a number. Um, I've been as high as 6.1. Like I said, diabetes runs in my family. My maternal grandfather uh, had uh, was a brittle diabetic. My mother has diabetes. So I'm kind of on that watch list. Um, so 5.7 to 6.4% indicates pre-diabetes and a level of 6.5 or higher, you might right be in that range of diabetes. So if you pop a 6.5 or higher on your test, your doctor is going to be very concerned. If you are below, like let's say 4.6 to 5.6, you're fine in this one area. And if you're 5.7 to 6.4 on your score, we need to watch you. Okay. So, um, that's another one, okay? Let's, uh, this is the topic that I do lecture a lot on. I've been uh, talking about low thyroid for 20 years. I'll be doing a lot of videos on this. It's a, it's a topic that I feel, um, I've worked with a lot of patients nutritionally. Um, I make a supplement, uh, my own custom supplement formulation for thyroid. So it's, it's something near and dear to my heart. Um, I've had family members that I've worked with successfully to balance their thyroid. Um, I can often work with people that are on prescription medication, but still not feeling quite well. 
with their low thyroid and dial it in a little bit more with uh, maybe a natural supplement that piggybacks onto it or with, um, uh, if they're not on a medication at this time, I can use my formulation to help balance them. But um, common symptoms of low thyroid is feeling tired. Uh, the symptoms of this condition develop slowly, so you might not notice it right away. People can have 10 or 15 years of low thyroid symptom and go undiagnosed with low thyroid. And that's why it's an interesting topic because you'll just feel mildly icky and crappy all the time for years. And every time you go get your blood work, it comes back normal, but something's there. I read, a, I can't pull up the quote, but um, it might have been Mary Solomon's book, but 13 million Americans um, are thought to have undiagnosed low thyroid. So the thyroid is, um, th their thyroid is not functioning optimally, so they're still feeling many of the symptoms on the list of low thyroid, yet they don't have the disease of hypothyroidism. And until they get that diagnosis, nobody wants to handle them. Nobody wants to touch them. But that makes a, over the years, that was a good patient for me because I know how to balance that person out for at least that first decade until they're really into more of the crisis level of low thyroid. But here are some of the symptoms. Uh, symptoms of low thyroid include fatigue, weakness, weight gain, um, also increased difficulty in losing weight. So you try really hard, but you just can't lose weight. Your hair changes, it's more coarse, dry, brittle, breaks. Uh, your skin can be uh, rough, dry. You can have um, vertical ridges on your fingernails, not just one nail, but many nails, you know, all the nails, you'll feel little ridges vertically, uh, hair loss, cold intolerance. You're the type of person that always needs a sweater when you're in the um, theater or a restaurant. Um, I remember um, even my mom, who uh, again uh, has some of these things, because a lot of them go together and balance your hormones. You're going to look at your uh, you're going to look at your blood sugar level. You're going to look at your adrenals, your thyroid. There's many components that bring this all in. So my mom is always like, "Are you cold?" Ask me when we're at a restaurant. Um, thinking that I might be cold too. So you might have yourself or someone in your life that's always thinks everybody needs to wear a sweater because they need to wear a sweater because they're the ones that are cold and they think the whole world must be cold, but it's them. And sometimes that's a little clue. Um, muscle cramps, frequent muscle aches. There's so many symptoms. I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, videos on low thyroid. Like I said, it's something that I'm very interested in. I've worked uh, with a lot of cases over the years. And so I want to share some natural approaches to balance of the thyroid naturally. You'll see that in future videos. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, it's a syndrome, so it's not really a disease. Uh, in a syndrome, you're coordinating a lot of different symptoms. And if enough of those symptoms fill out the picture, you might get that diagnosis. Um, you know, some of the questions that people ask or your physician or your healthcare provider might ask is, have you been tired for more than six months? Because that means there's a chronic nature to the, to the fatigue. If you've been just tired since last week when you were uh, partying it up and not getting much sleep, that's not called chronic fatigue. That's more acute fatigue. So we're looking for people that have had fatigue. It's usually even much more than six months. It's, people will say, I've been tired for years. And, um, and that's more gets into the chronic fatigue. And that's a tough topic to handle because it, again, is multiple system oriented. I really think when I've worked on cases in my uh, practice with chronic fatigue, I always looked at exercise, diet. We put people on supplements. We're looking at their blood work. We're looking for all different ways to have a multifaceted approach because if it was just one thing, they wouldn't even be in your office. They would have been better already. Um, it does more commonly uh, affect people in their 20s to mid 40s. It could also affect children uh, in those teen years of 13 to 15. Uh, here's a topic I don't know a lot about. I'm just going to be honest. I'll tell you when I do know a lot about a topic and I'll tell you when I don't. This is not, I don't know if I've ever really had anybody with narcolepsy come into my office in 22 years. So I don't want to claim I know a lot about this, but it would be on the why am I always tired list. I put it down here. Um, it's a condition that causes people to fall asleep suddenly. They'll just 
fall asleep while you're talking to them. They can fall asleep at the dinner table. They fall asleep while they're watching TV. Um, and let's go on. So sleep debt. Humans cannot li live without sleep. Uh, so eventually we all have to sleep. And for many people, sleep debt is that chronic feeling tired all the time. Um, you don't, you're not getting enough sleep. It can impact your health. Like I said, it could give you more accidents. Uh, it elevates cortisol levels. So when the cortisol levels are elevated, we're gonna gain weight around our trunk. We'll get trunkal obesity, which is your, um, that body, butt, thighs, uh, even the neck, you'll get thick. And uh, it's hard to lose weight when you're fatigued all the time. I wrote an article uh, years ago on how to lose weight while you're sleeping. I think it was even, a, I, I wrote a book on, called Quantum Paleo, and it might have even been a chapter in that book, or not a chapter, but a subsection, where when people sleep more and get really their adequate amount of sleep, they'll have an initial weight loss usually. One of the reasons is they're not eating when they're sleeping, but also the cortisol levels start to quiet down and uh, balance, and because of this, um, your body will have a great response to it. You'll have more energy, but you'll also feel like some of that fluffy, stagnant weight comes off pretty quick. Um, so here's the bonus one. And it's, again, it's uh, something, a topic that I do really love to, to work with and talk about. And um, one of the reasons I like this topic is because um, I've had a lot of success with it. I've also experienced adrenal fatigue myself. Um, I'm practicing here in New York City where we have a lot of stressed out New York City people. I'm sure you're stressed out where you are too, but we definitely have, I mean, New York is known for its stressed out, high strung people. So I see people all the time that need a little support with adrenals. The adrenal theory, to me, is not even a theory, but it suggests that prolonged exposure to stress will drain the adrenals. So any glands that overworks will eventually begin to underfunction. And the cortisol levels, which is a hormone level in your body, gets all messed up. Uh, this depletion or this rundown adrenal gland. Now the adrenals are these little glands that sit on top of your kidneys. So if this is your kidney, it's like a little, little cap on top of the kidney. Um, and look at the word renal. Renal is in the word ad renal. So it means on top of the kidney on top of the renal. So that's where they're located. And you have two of them, one on the left, one on the right. Um, but brain fog, low energy, depression or depressed moods. What's interesting, you'll crave either salt or sweet. Um, so my, uh, had a lot of patients that, I see more salt than sweet. So they'll say they have a more of a salty craving. Uh, now, I have had adrenal fatigue before and I always crave sweets. So, but most of my patients crave salt when their, their adrenals are depleted. Lightheadedness and there's a whole host of symptoms. Um, and that's uh, another topic I'll be drilling much deeper and, and trying to share information. Not only how to, uh, you know, well, to learn about it, but also, you know, how to deal with it and, and to maybe improve. Um, that actually is another formula that I made because over the years, I really tried to fine tune a herbal or natural balancing formula that would work. So I've fiddled with that formulation for years and I have one on, um, in my nutritional store. Um, this is how you can find me. I also have a very active chiropractic um, YouTube channel and um, very active Instagram channel if you want to get entertained that way. That's more on chiropractic. Um, for these type of videos, this will be housed on my Health Hacker YouTube channel. That's what you're watching now. Please subscribe, hit the alert so you know when I'm gonna put the video out. I'm gonna try to do a few videos uh, every week and be consistent, so thank you so much for checking this out today.